I'd like to welcome you to our final speaker series event for this academic year for the Meltzer Center for Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging. My name is Kenji Yoshino, and I'm the faculty director of the center. For this event, I'm delighted and honored to introduce our distinguished guest, Heather McGee. Heather McGee designs and promotes solutions to inequality in America. Over her career in public policy, she's crafted legislation, testified before Congress, and helped shape presidential campaign platforms. Heather holds a BA in American Studies from Yale University and a JD from UC Berkeley School of Law. For nearly two decades, she helped build the nonpartisan think tank Demos, serving four years as a president of that organization. She regularly appears in the media, including in venues like Meet the Press and Morning Joe, The Washington Post, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal. And she's currently a visiting lecturer in urban studies at CUNY's School of Labor and Urban Studies. Today's conversation will focus on Heather's terrific book, The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together, which spent 10 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list and was long listed for the National Book Award and the Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Nonfiction. It was also adapted into a Spotify podcast by Higher Ground, the production company of Barack and Michelle Obama, and into a young adult reader's version that was just released this February. Everyone attending this event has been entered into a raffle to receive an ebook version of The Sum of Us, which you can see behind me today. I'm delighted to welcome Heather to NYU Law. Toward the end of today's program, I'll open up for Q&A. Please submit any questions you have through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. So without further ado, I'm going to jump right in. Heather, welcome. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks for the Meltzer Center and uh, the entire NYU Law community, uh, and to you for hosting. Um, I'm really glad to be with you. Wonderful. So I'm going to begin uh, by just jumping right into the book. Uh, early in that work, you argued that the United States, quote, has had the world's largest economy for much of, most of our history with enough money to feed and educate all our children, build world leading infrastructure, and generally ensure a high standard of living for everyone, close quote. Yet you point out that, quote, with the exception of about 40 years from the New Deal to the 1970s, the United States has had a weaker commitment to public goods and to the public good than every country that possesses anywhere near our wealth, close quote. What is your explanation for why, as you put it, Americans are so singularly stingy towards ourselves? Um, well, you know, this is really the question that was kind of the overarching one through my career when I was working in economic policy, um, being a sort of relatively ideologically lonely and progressive economic policy wonk in the Beltway and looking at the ways in which 40 years into what I call the inequality era, we had 1% of the population owning more wealth than the entire middle class, while nearly half of adult workers were paid too little to meet their basic needs. And the basic social safety net had um, you know, been torn apart and had just not kept pace with the way families live, right? So cash welfare uh, was destroyed effectively uh, in the sort of biggest political um, sort of flashpoint in my coming of age. I was 16 when uh, the welfare reform bill was passed. And so now most poor people don't get any cash welfare and the amounts that they get is are really meager. And then the kinds of things that you realize that today's families need to have to sort of meet the bare minimum um, you know, paid family leave, paid sick days, health insurance, uh, any kind of housing supports, childcare assistance, you know, it's just not standard. Um, and so that sense that we were not doing enough, that people were not paid enough to be able to individually afford the cost of living, um, and that the society in the public realm was not doing enough, um, was really kind of what I worked on my whole career in various different ways. And, and what we would often do was, you know, kind of do economic models to show how good for the economy it would be if we would just make people uh, able to live with a little bit more dignity, how there would be a 
four to one um, kind of benefit, economic benefit for investing in uh, early childhood education and like right, trying to sort of use um, kind of the, the, the decision makers own arguments uh, uh, in order to get them to invest in our people. And ultimately what I realized was that it actually wasn't about that. And there was something else that was holding us back, uh, holding decision makers uh, back uh, from investing in our people. And it had very little to do with dollars and cents and with statistical analysis. And so that's why I realized that I needed to honestly sort of intellectually, you know, put down law and economics, which I'd been, you know, schooled in and look into the social sciences and really understand what was really going on in our politics and in our public storytelling and belief systems, our community psychology, um, to really understand the way in which the fundamental question of who belongs and who deserves and the diversity of the American public and particularly the diversity of the American public who are struggling financially really was more determinative of our generosity, our public generosity and our employer generosity than any kind of rational economic calculation. Yeah, can you say a little bit more about that? Because you attribute the stinginess to racism uh, yeah. rather than to alternative explanations that are often yeah. offered, like libertarian ideology, the ethos of the Western frontier, our founding rebellion against government, right? All of these are alternative explanations that you consider. Yeah. What do you find unconvincing about those alternative explanations? What was the kind of light bulb moment where you thought, you know, it's not about these things that are the traditional explanations for mm -hmm. American exceptionalism, but rather something more about race or social identity? Well, I think there's two ways of looking at it. One is history, right? We, all, we weren't always so stingy. Um, and in fact, coming out of the uh, first Gilded Age of inequality, which we've now surpassed uh, in terms of inequality, coming out of the Great Depression, you know, we had a new social contract that helped to create the greatest middle class the world had ever seen. And it really relied on a very muscular role for government and a real sense that it was the government's right and responsibility to ensure a decent standard of living for people. But it just happened that most of those benefits, virtually all of them were in one way or another racially exclusionary. And we can come back and I can give the sort of litany of that, but from housing to social security, to the GI bill, to the labor standards really effectively, either with very racist language, like in the housing code, with exclusions, like in social security, uh, just total categorical exclusions, like in social security, or just because it was a benefit that impacted a very segregated and discriminatory labor market or housing market or educational market in most of the 20th century just was basically for whites only. So it was a very generous social contract with that racial and gendered asterisk. And it wasn't until we began to, because of the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement really have uh, people of color and women included in the um, in the social contract that it became so meager. So that's that's one piece. Just looking at the history and and in the book, the central metaphor is the story of the the drained public pool, and and that's um, what is uh, the, on the cover of the book. You see a little white boy running off a. Uh, diving board into a pool that a little black girl is already in. And that's sort of the, the world, um, you know, that we could have had with integrated public pools all over the country. Um, but in fact, many towns and cities across the country in the wake of public pool integration or desegregation uh, by courts in the 1950s decided to drain their public pools rather than integrate them. And so, of course, what's the lesson of a community that would be willing to drain its public pool rather than integrate it is that, you know, everybody loses out because of racism. Something that was a free public good is destroyed or in some cases it was privatized. Towns would sell their beautiful uh, New Deal era thousand plus swimmer public pools to a private institution that could then segregate, right? Um, so that metaphor of drained pool politics really, for me, helped me understand something that I'd been taught in a much, um, in a kind of race neutral way 
in my education and in my career, which was, well, we used to have this era of shared prosperity in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s, and then we had this neoliberal revolution in the 70s to today, and that's what changed. It's like, well, you can't really understand that story historically without the role of race. Um, of course, there was organizing by corporations. Of course, there were, you know, there was the economic shocks of the 1970s. Of course, there were the attacks on organized labor. But what's the common sense that made the new neoliberal, which is a word that doesn't actually show up in the book, The Some of Us, because I really didn't want to use confusing language. And I think neoliberal is actually a confusing word to most people. Um, but, you know, what, what was the logic that made it common sense for like the same, you know, kind of average white family that had been New Dealers um, and Democrats to switch to saying, yeah, I, I'm, I'm buying what this Reagan person is, is putting down, right? And of course, we know that Lyndon Johnson was the last Democrat running for president to win the majority of white voters to this day after he signed the Civil Rights Act. And what that stood for was the party of the New Deal becoming also the party of civil rights, losing not just the South as Johnson famously um, predicted, but also the majority of white voters. Um, and then there's just really contemporarily, Kenji, looking at you know, today's um, views in the public opinion data on kind of anti-government libertarian views. Um, if you are a white person with high levels of anti-black racial resentment, and racial resentment is a particular sociological term that has to do with this idea that black people take more than we give to society. Um, if you are a white person with high levels of racial resentment, you are 60 percentage points more likely to be opposed to more government spending, just period. Mm. Right? And there's all this different kind of social science that I got into the weeds in for the research for the book, which really looks at how racialized views impact white Americans' views of issues that aren't necessarily racial until they're cued to be, right? And so there's a politics part of this as well. Yeah, and I, I have to say that, you know, it's a stroke of genius to have the drain pool be the organizing metaphor uh, for your book. Uh, it's so powerful in driving home this notion of, you know, zero sum politics where you would rather no one have it uh, rather than, you know, have share it right uh, with other individuals. And I have to say that I can't look anywhere without seeing it now. I saw a recent <laughs> case. <laughs> a county in Texas where they were debating whether to close their public library after being required by a federal judge to return banned books to the shelves, right? So it's like, it's everywhere, right? It's really everywhere. And Kenji, you know, um, you know, like you're whistling and covering, I mean, I think, you know, the, the goal of a writer is to try to create something that people will maybe forget who wrote it, um, though I didn't, right? But uh, to forget who wrote it, but just, you know, be able to hear something and never be able to unhear it. And then to, to put on a different set of glasses and to be able to see a theme all over the place. Um, the thing that I really struck me about the drained pool and, um, you know, as I've been going around the country now for almost, well, for two and a half years with the book is that it's one of those stories that is both, unbelievable right unbelievable that a town would actually like pour cement into its own pool that they loved unbelievable and yet totally believable mm. right nobody's like oh no america wouldn't do that you know what i mean everyone's like yeah we probably would right um so it it it's um it's just interesting to think about so much of the reception to the book has been by people who learn a lot every chapter about our history that they didn't know. And of course, I learned so much in researching the book. Um, and so it's a lot of like, whoa, you know, um, because I'm, I'm sort of proving over and over again the, the role that explicit racism had in much of our policy infrastructure, right? Most of, you know, our economic policies over the course of our history. And, um, and so there's a lot of, I didn't know that. Um, but at the same time, it's very credible, right? Um, well, it's credible because you show it with sort of backbreaking research. So I want to, you know, you know, congratulate you. And this is not just a metaphor that is immediately kind of recognizable and vivid. It's also something that you sort of play out in this 
a completely convincing way across a variety of social domains. So just so our, re our watchers, our listeners have the benefit of that, you sort of talk about how the strain pool politics or zero sum paradigm sort of manifests some policy areas as disparate as housing, education, and healthcare. You know, you don't need to talk about all three, you know, pick whichever ones you want, but could you sort of play it out for us just uh, to yeah. replicate the kind of incredibly um, sedulous research that you've done throughout this work? This word. <laughs> so um, I haven't been with them um, with the legal academics in a while. <laughs> you guys are so smart. <laughs> um, so let's pick healthcare. Um, so one of the things that my book tries to do is uncover the fingerprints of racism and some of the kind of head scratchers of American society. Like why don't we have universal health care? Like all of our peer economies have it. We spend so much, we get so little. It's this big exceptionalism and not in a good way, right? Um, and so why, right? <laughs> like what gives, you know? Nobody's happy with our healthcare system, you know? Um, and as it turns out, Harry Truman, you know, proposed national health insurance in the 1940s and he was blocked by his own party by the Dixiecrat Segregationist Caucus in his own party who saw that the idea of equal healthcare, um, they saw that as a threat to Jim Crow, right? So that was, you know, that's why Truman didn't get it at a time in the post-war period when it seemed like it, it could have been possible in the war era when it seemed like it could have been possible. And then today, of course, the closest thing we have to universal healthcare is the Affordable Care Act, which is, you know, a very modest, you know, market solution um, it's basically like a shopping portal with some subsidies and some, you know, standards and safeguards that are all very popular. You know, if you take sort of the 12 provisions of the act, kind of summarize them and, and ask most uh, white Americans, do you agree with this? They're like, yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. You know, pre-existing conditions, 26, some tax credits, et cetera. Um, but then when you wrap it up under Obamacare, somehow it becomes... Uh, unpopular, right? So even though white Americans are the largest share of the uninsured, um, they uh, have the majority of white folks have been opposed to the Affordable Care Act since the first black president signed it into law. And then of course, you know, for my legal friends, um, we don't actually have what the Affordable Care Act was meant to have, to, um, be, which is 50 states have expanded up the income ladder coverage for working class people under Medicaid, right? That was supposed to be a 50 state automatic program. But um, the Roberts Court, uh, using a state's rights legal theory, and every time you hear state's rights, your, your, your alarm bell should go off, um, you know, decided that it was uh, onerous for the federal government to expand the Medicaid threshold and so left it to the states. And then of course, as soon as that happened, we had this new Mason-Dixon line of healthcare where most of the former Confederate states refused to expand Medicaid and most of the former union states didn't, you know, expanded Medicaid. And you can see because of this real life, you know, laboratory experiment, the benefits in lives lost, in jobs created, in healthcare infrastructure and hospitals preserved and expanded in states that took that essentially free money to federal money to expand Medicaid. And still today, you know, we have these 10 holdouts and there's been social science research that shows that there's a real correlation between the black population uh, in a state and the white power structures resistance to expanding Medicaid. And in the book, I, I, I go to Texas, which is the state with the highest level of uh, uninsured population, which is having this crisis of closing rural hospitals, right? This is mostly in white conservative areas where they're losing their hospitals and the one out of every seven jobs, excuse me, New York, and the one out of every seven jobs that comes with it um, because they're, they've just so demonized the idea of Obamacare and Medicaid expansion. Um, and who, you know, who really pays the cost of that, right? It's everybody, it's this sort of drained pool, um, knee-jerk anti-government, um, disparaging uh, views of who would need a handout 
of healthcare affordability that is highly racialized and stigmatized and ultimately ends up costing us in so many different ways. Wonderful, thank you. So I'm going to ask a bit of a um, challenging question now. Okay. Uh, so, uh, this is a, a question that sort of flitted across my mind, even as I was persuaded throughout by the argument. Yeah. And it's, is this zero sum paradigm always false? So when I think uh -huh. about, you know, diversity and inclusion, a okay. lot of the backlash seems to focus on areas where there do seem to be concrete winners and losers, right? A finite mm -hmm. number of college admission slots where one person gaining admission means another person misses out or a promotion where people are competing for a limited number of openings. So how do you analyze cases where there isn't an obvious win-win outcome or yeah. am I missing something in these examples? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. And, and, and um, you know, I do think that the limited slots examples like affirmative action play an outsized role in our country's understanding of race relations and racism because of that right because they are uh, because the the goal throughout and i actually um locate the beginning of this zero-sum story which has been told by elites in order to pit people who struggle against one another, you know, in racial camps, um, you know, I pit that, I locate that in history and say how it's been sort of reanimated generation after generation. And I think that there's been such an emphasis on affirmative action, um, which, you know, has, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, not to be controversial, but right there, there, there are many, the share of, uh, black and brown students at elite colleges is lower right now than it was 35 years ago. The main beneficiaries of affirmative action have been white women. You know, if you do look at the data, a white person is much more likely to be uh, competing against another white person for a slot than one of the underrepresented minorities, right? So like it, it is both important to our society and it's like wildly overstated as the, the way in which many, but I'll actually say statistically, most white people see racism co coming into play as the government or employers preferencing people of color over white people. Like that's the way they actually have seen it for most of our history. And obviously the movement for black lives and George Floyd created a, an opening and a shift in that. But just to say like affirmative action as a story does a lot of work, right? Um, and, and helps to define a zero sum, uh, it helps to define the zero sum and make it make common sense. So um, how, do I, how do I deal with that? Well, one, you know, in, in the book and, and when I talk about it, I do like to sort of, you know, do a little bit of fact checking around the role of affirmative action and, and the sort of myth that it's like an underqualified minority versus a qualified minority and I mean, majority member and all of that um, because it's very rarely what we think it is right, right what the common perception is of the like one slot and um and you know the the thumb is being placed on the scale uh for somebody who's not deserving but then i also and you know i've had a many many conversations very oddly to me kenji the um, the book has been really picked up by a fair number of like corporate types. And I'm like, did you read the book? Like every time I mention a corporation, they're the villain. Like what are we talking about here? Um, but I think, you know, the economic arguments are interesting to them. And so in, in those conversations, you know, there's this sense of we're leaving growth on the table. And so, yes, Right now, I'm saying we need to diversify our board and we need to diversify our management. And yes, that means that if there are five C-suite, you know, or management positions, and then right now all five white men, then yes, it is going to be some white man is not going to be there anymore. But the goal is um, that because the business science in as much as there's such a thing like tells us that the study of, of enterprise and innovation tells us that diversity is such a superior growth model that 
you can have a, an all white and all male smaller business, or you can have a bigger business that is more innovative and profitable because diverse groups of people are just better at problem solving, at seeing different perspectives of the same issue, at being able to reach new consumer bases, that we're trying to grow the pie and therefore it won't be a zero sum of the smaller pie. It will be really about making new slices for everyone to enjoy. So that's kind of the way I deal with the both affirmative action kind of in schools and the corporate piece. Um, but you know, there's also like a, a, a way in which um, the, the idea that's in the sort of end of the book around the solidarity dividend, the, right, this argument that you said about the win-win, that, that there are gains to be had, cleaner air, better funded schools, just like better policy decisions that can happen through cross-racial solidarity and rejecting the zero sum. You know, if you look at um, where this often comes up in coalitions, it's like around funding for schools or, um, you know, housing reforms, right? Housing zoning reforms, where it's saying we need to change the zoning so that there are more um, uh, non-single family houses and there's more housing affordability in a suburban community. Um, there's the zero sum there. It's like, well, we are we going to take some of the extra money from one school district and give it to a, an underfunded school district or an underfunded school within the district? Are we going to potentially threaten my property values by creating more housing. And ultimately there is a level at which I can make all these economic arguments and say it's, you know, it's totally win-win. But then there has to be the point at which we say we are living in a cramped, underfunded society. <laughs> and we all do better even if we don't have as much short-term financial gain, which we've been conditioned to want because it is so terrible not to have money in our society. And we know we can only get it on our own. We can't depend on any kind of common provision of the things that make for a decent life. We actually, maybe it's okay to give up a little bit of that, you know, casino of housing prices, you know, that unearned wealth. Um, in order to have a society that a neighborhood that is safer um, and a neighborhood where my son or daughter can actually afford to live within 10 minutes of me if I'm like an, a, you know, a boomer, right? Um, um, where I am actually able to hire house, you know, people who, who work care for me if I'm getting older, right? Because they don't have to take 25 buses and 39 trains in order to get to me because I wanna live, you know, age in place. Like it's those kinds of quality of life um, defined a little bit more broadly that I think we have to appeal to, um, to get out of the zero sum as well. Yeah, and one of the things I, I love about the book is that you actually offer this equally vivid solution called the solidarity dividend that you've just, you know, alluded to. So, you know, if we can actually pursue that. So let's take as read that even if there's only like a subset of instances where the solidarity dividend would manifest, like let's just even grant, right, that there are some cases where yeah. zero sum politics uh, obtains. Uh, even if there's some subset of cases where zero sum politics could be transformed into the solidarity dividend, that would be a huge, huge win, right, yeah. for American society. So my questions now are like, how do we get there, right? So many commentators have argued that when advocating for policy reforms in areas like housing, education, healthcare, progressive politicians and activists should avoid talking directly about race but instead make these broad economic appeals, right? So these kind of anodyne claims of like, you know, don't close the swimming pool because that's gonna hurt, you know, the entire community or, you know, let's embrace, you know, these goals because uh, this is gonna lead to maximal growth while leaving the racial dimensions, you know, out of it. So how do you respond to these arguments? Because there's a lot of upswitching going on, right? Of saying like, yeah, I think about Mark Lilla's book, for example, The Once a Future Liberal of saying, you know, let's stop talking about, you know, groups and particularly about race and let's just kind of advert up to the higher level of generality of we're all citizens here. What's your response to that kind of argumentation? 
Well, my response is, why are they closing the pool anyway? <laughs> right? Like, what are, what are we even talking about? Right? Um, right? That um, my response is, is, I can give a tactical response, right? So as somebody who's, you know, been in the rooms, advised candidates, been really thinking about this in, in, um, in real time, you know, advising coalitions and advocates, okay, how do we, how do we frame this, et cetera? Um, two things. One, the political discourse and our own individual meaning making is so racialized already that it is a fiction that we can have race neutral messaging. When you say public, you are already outside of the realm of race neutral messaging. Right, so good communicators know that there is both what we say and what is heard. And once you realize that what is heard is so often racially coded terms, co terms that have a racial meaning and a racial valence, an identity meaning and an identity valence, you can just sort of stop pretending like there is such a thing as communicating without communicating about who we are and who we're talking about. And now, so that's like the first proposition. Then what do you do with that? Then it gets more interesting. Um, then what we discovered, I helped to design and sort of put out in the world this, this thing that now has its own life and I'm not as involved in it anymore, but it's called the race class narrative. And it was basically an attempt to use a lot of some of the best kind of polling and, and focus groups and online testing to really try to get at this question. How do you counter the dog whistle politics? How do you tell a story that is resonant with a multiracial coalition, right? Because that's, that's the challenge, right? Um, and, you know, how do you talk about race within that? And what we discovered was that the most was that A, everybody hears race all the time, that the kind of, um, for lack of a better term, like right story and left story about the role of race and government and the economy are, are things that most people can parrot each one. And it's not like we are, the majority of Americans is in the middle of it. It's like the majority of the American, of the American people, black, white, brown, et cetera, like hear both. And they're kind of like, yeah, to both. And it really just sort of matters, um, A, what deeper frames they use when they hear both types of messages. The message that says what's wrong with the economy is the rich people are taking you know, their unfair share. And the message that says what's wrong with the economy is that you know, immigrants and you know, un lazy people are taking their unfair share. It's like both are like, yep, oh yeah, yeah there's something to that. But what we realized and what we found and what was really confirmed on doors and in campaigns now for years now since this project first began, which is that if organizers are able to create a story that talks about race, but explicitly talks about how it's used to divide us, that calls to our common sense of who we are and what we want and says, you know, no matter what we look like or who we love, we all want to keep our families safe. We all want to have enough to uh, take care of our families. But some people, some politicians and you know the donors that pay for them are pointing the finger at new immigrants and poor people and black and brown people, all right? So you name the race piece as a division. You name the sort of corporate scapegoat, the kind of wealthy scape, the wealthy kind of um, villain, which is what kind of populist politics would do, but doesn't usually include the race piece. And then you remind people that by coming together, we actually can have the collective power to overcome a powerful interest. And so it's that architecture that helps us, most importantly, inoculate. Because the next time we want our listeners to hear the race baiting politics, we want them to have a new way of seeing that speaker, that political speaker, right? Which says, oh, actually, 
I know they're trying to sell me that story. Why? How are they profiting from the sale of that story, right? Why, why do they want me to blame an immigrant for what's going on in my community? And that is, a, is the kind of work that needs to be done, not just with one commercial, obviously needs to be done. The most effective way we learn is that it's really within the context of real organizing and, and listening and relationship building. Um, so the question is, how do you do that at scale in our society? But um, there is a way to basically just tell the truth about what's going on in our politics and why this cultural war politics is being waged by people who have a very redistributive upwards economic agenda. I mean, what do they really want when they want to, um, when they're trying to ban books and close libraries? What does it have to do with taxes? You know, what does it have to do with the role of government, the size of government, the capability of government to regulate corporations and to redistribute wealth? And you know, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, uh, you know, you may have already answered this, but I can't resist sort of uh, talking about a kind of punch in the gut moment in your book uh, about sort of the short-lived nature of allyship. So. Uh, you note in your book that the share of white Americans who said that racism was a big problem fell from 45% in June 2020 in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder to just 33% in August, right? So this is a question of like, how do we sustain the work, right? So how can white people be persuaded to join racial justice movements, not just for a brief period of mass protest, but also over the long haul? Yeah, yeah, so I was finishing up the book that summer which was a crazy time. Um, and then I, my editor kind of wrestled the manuscript out of my claws and right when Biden was, the election was called for Biden the first week in, December, in November. And so I was really watching, you know, trying to get as much data as I could about where, where white public opinion was going on this, right? We were seeing this unbelievable thing, right? This largest social demonstration movement in American history, the vast majority of which is happening in majority white counties. And, you know, this, this huge all sector kind of permission and hunger to learn more about race and racism and to talk about it um, as messy as it was. And yes, you know, I had access to some of the political, um, you know, polling that was being done that saw that essentially the, the way in which the right was able to paint the Black Lives Matter protests as violent, even though 95% of them involved no, no such thing as even property destruction, right, um, was having an effect and was creating this sort of fear, law and order kind of um, softening of the sense of what shouldn't necessarily have been related, which is, is racism a problem or not? Like whether or not, right, the protests are all violent, but does that mean that racism isn't a problem? You know, so it's just an interesting thing. That said, I think, you know, now if I were to write um, uh, another afterward, um, there's been a surprising durability of the consciousness raising. And this is actually something I, I like to really push back on everywhere I can, because there's a little bit of a sense that we have that, oh, that was the summer of 2020 and now there's a backlash, you know? And it's like for every force, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And I, it's just not actually true. There is what we sh should have anticipated which is a coordinated, well-funded, highly partisan attempt to demonize something very threatening to them, which is a multiracial, anti-racist governing majority coalition, right? And to try to, for example, just one example, you know, turn the word woke, which was created by black people two generations ago, to say, you know, are you conscious or not? Do you know what's going on or are you sleepwalking? And to make that an insult. And, you know, and so the right wing does it and a few politicians do it and then the New York Times starts to do it and then it's suddenly like, oh, woke is a bad word now. And actually go ahead and you pull the American public and the majority of Americans think woke is not an insult but a compliment. And it's like, well, duh, nobody wants to be asleep. You know, <laughs> like we, we have this kind of, um, 
rubbernecking that we do around the really antisocial crazy stuff, uh, the banning of the books, the like really antisocial behavior that feels terrifying and un-American. And so we, you know, we, we look at it a lot, we cover it a lot, um, we amplify it because of our rigged system of representation, wildly unpopular laws like the banning of books and thought and speech is able to make it through legislatures. But in each and every one of those states, it's not popular, mm -hmm. right? The majority of Americans do not want to see books banned, no matter what's in them, right? The majority of Americans are wildly supportive of their libraries, are supportive of their teachers, think that, um, you know, woke is a, is a good thing. And, you know, after the murder of Tyrese Nichols, that weekend, there was a flash poll by Politico and, and the majority of white Republicans agreed that police brutality is a problem and that it's a racial problem, right? So I just, I, I don't think that there is, I think there are a lot of people, frankly, in very um, liberal institutions who were always uncomfortable with um, the consciousness raising and with the paradigm shift and who have made it seem, this is like the New York Times set that I'm talking about, right? the, uh, you know, the, the, the Ivy League set um, and who have an outsized kind of role in our discourse, um, who have made it seem like the David Brooks kind of avatar of the world has, is, is in the backlash camp. Um, but I think that fundamentally outside of that very elite sector, most Americans, when asked by asking them how to vote, by asking them whether they support the reactionary politics or whether they support, you know, leaving people alone and fairness, have continued since 2020 and frankly 2016 lost the popular vote you know but you know to to say that's not that's not actually what we want and so i think we should have a little bit more um we shouldn't be so scared of our own shadows and people who have um woken up don't usually go back to sleep and you can't unlearn a lot of the things that you know everyday americans of all races have learned in the um wake of George Floyd's murder. And that's a good thing for this country. Thank you for that. So uh, this is going to be my last question. So for those of you in the audience, please uh, type your questions into the chat. Um, so uh, it, it picks up right where you left off with this uh, deep uh, hopefulness. You remind me of our uh, mutual friend, Dolly Chug, and being so clear eyed and uh, profoundly hopeful. And I lean on uh, actually both of your work in order to sustain uh, my own hope. Um, so in that vein, uh, let me actually uh, lean on you a little bit more and say, mm -hmm. on the one hand, this kind of vision of, yes, we see all this anti-trans legislation, attacks on reproductive freedom, opposition to so-called critical race theory, et cetera, et cetera. So it just feels like um, kind of a, a very dire time to be living. Yeah. In. And I hear you saying back to that in this kind of hopeful way of uh, there's this outsized kind of grip on our discourse by a very small amount of people. And that if we actually look at public opinion polling, if you look at the people that you're talking to, the kind of median uh, citizen, right, is actually much more sympathetic to the solidarity dividend than this might uh, imply. So I hear all of that. I think the only other piece that I want reassurance on goes right back to the beginning of the book, which is to say, essentially, I, I want help squaring that deep hopefulness with this neurosis, right, that we're really talking about. At some level, what you're saying is, right, racism hurts white people. Uh, and the reason that they can't see that racism is not in their own self-interest is because they have a deep um, investment, right, in uh, racism, even when it's against their own economic and social mm -hmm. interests. So how do we square those two points, right? Because you say quite convincingly that this is like a neurosis, like it's an irrational kind of prioritization of this horribly negative thing, racism, over many other public social goods. That's a neurosis, right? Yeah. So why is it that we can say simultaneously that a lot of people in society have this neurosis, 
right? But we nonetheless should be hopeful. Right? <laughs> People will see that this is not in their social interest and be able to move beyond that. So yeah. can I end by asking for your help there, Heather? Yeah, no, I hear you. I really do. Um, so I think there's a few things. One, it's, um, you know, as I was saying, when we found in the race class narrative work that like the persuadable middle, which is sort of two thirds in the ideological middle of the country um, is not like holds both at one time, right? And the real question is who's speaking to them most recently and loudest and most compellingly. And so, um, like any of us, like I know it's not good to drink and eat processed food. I know that. I'm aware of that fact. I also have a desire to do both of those things, right? And so it's like, how often am I doing? Am I listening to the angel on my shoulder or the devil on my shoulder? Like, right? We really need to like think about people as human beings who've gotten a lot of conditioning, and often surprise themselves and you right um and so you know i think that when you have um i think like i, I don't know i almost want to like leave it there on just like the fundamental question of like are we going to be okay and how um how can we be both deeply susceptible how can the majority of white americans be both deeply susceptible to zero sum storytelling and also open to calls for solidarity. Mm -hmm. Both are true. The question is who's loudest, who's in their ear, who's going through their lives with them and helping them make meaning. Mm -hmm. And when we have a cultural power force like Donald Trump, right? A media force like Donald Trump, then that's who's really loud in helping making media meaning, right? And we have Fox News and we have um, a social media algorithm that really orients people towards outrage and filter bubbles, right? That that is loud. But that doesn't mean, but what you know, what was loud was also seeing in every state in the country, mostly white people marching for black lives. That was really loud, right? And that made a lot of people curious and it made a lot of people open to new information. Mm -hmm. And so there's no static response to it. It's about what we do. Thank you. So I'm gonna to move to audience questions now. Uh, this is a, a good callback to something that you said earlier about how broad the uptake of uh, this book has been in the corporate world. So the question is, how might corporations take the lead on implementing the solidarity dividend if uh, we have to wait for government to catch up? Yeah, yeah, it's it's been really interesting to see. Um, so I think one has been to really um, make a mission critical commitment to equity and to diversity because there's a, a lot of, we're doing this, we're setting diversity goals, we are having these workshops be, because of the summer of 2020, right? But if a, a deeper level of understanding that recognizes that it's actually about the mission and purpose of the business, and it's actually a business model challenge, means that it can be more enduring. And that when, you know, the naysayers get grouchier and louder in the staff meeting, the executives can say, actually, this is important to our bottom line. This is not just something we're doing because it's a fad in corporate America. So I think that's a really important piece. And then to sort of maybe the broader, the deeper question that maybe was um, uh, intended there, which is sort of what, it, what can corporations do in our society? You know, I think there is a ton. Um, something we, we haven't talked a lot about is that since I finished writing the book in November of 2020, you know, the first two years of the Biden administration and then clawing back, you know, with the CARES Act at the end of the Trump administration have seen a tremendous refilling of the pool of public goods, right? And because of the pandemic and because of the Recovery Act and 
and then the CHIPS Act and the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Bill, you know, we've seen just an amazing paradigm shift in terms of what I think of as solidarity dividends, right? These, these real um, gains around poverty or alleviation around new kinds of entitlements and new kinds of industrial policy. Um, and there's a big role for corporations to play in, you know, just take one example, there's, um, you know, the chips, the microchip bill uh, included in the guidance, the Department of um, Commerce said, well, if you're going to get a lot of money from the government for this um, chip making, you need to provide some sort of affordable uh, childcare, because that's actually really important to you being able to hire. Um, it's actually a big need that we have. There was a huge uh, care uh, executive order that was just released yesterday by the Biden administration. Um, being a part of the uh, chorus to say these are good things and that the sort of general um, places where we've neglected our people and our families for so long are good for business and are good for our economic growth is a way um, that corporations can can help be a part of the solution. Great. Uh, I think this is a related question. Um, how do we address growing the pie uh, within a world of increasing environmental impacts of growth? Right. And let me tag on and say yeah. kind of broadly, we might say, um, what if you know growth is impossible or what right. if growth isn't necessarily uh, appropriate or good thing to do in a particular domain? Does that hurt the case yeah. for the solidarity? Dividend? So I think we need to think about what is the what, growing what? Um, what do people really need, <laughs> right? Uh, there's just like a certain amount of, you know, no matter who we are, we basically need the same things in life, like a roof over our head, enough disposable income, um, you know, healthcare, college, childcare, right? Like, you know, like the things. And we have decided as a society that we're going to each pay for them. And at some point, we never released this, um, these numbers, but we did a whole sort of internal research project at Demos where we said, okay, let's look at what the average middle-class family pays for all these things, right? Your sort of cost of life and see how much they pay, um, you know, in the, in the median, you know, community for them and then see how much it would cost fiscally to provide them socially and then using this existing redistribution, we, uh, sorry, using the existing um, tax code and distribution, if we just passed all those costs 100% on, like back to that middle-class family, but they were socialized costs through increased taxes to pay for free childcare and free healthcare and da, da, da. And it was like the savings were over 50%, right? Um, so I do think that there is a certain amount of bad for the environment, bad for quality of life, bad for all, you know, so many different ways, race to growth that we do because we are trying to solve what are collective problems individually. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also think that, you know, bottom line, the new paradigm of a carbon constrained future is one in which we work very differently, work a lot less and serve a lot more for our common needs um, to, to address resiliency. Um, wow. And I think that's okay. <laughs> yeah. No, no, please, now finish. I, I, no, please. no, that's it. Yeah, that's all. Okay. Um, this is actually, you know, follows, you know, on themes of sort of inclusion and growth. So uh, the George W. Bush administration came to this view on immigration in 2007, the questioner says, um, quote, a review of economic research finds immigrants not only help fuel the nation's economic growth, uh, but also have an overall positive effect on the income of native born workers, close quote. Mm. Side mm -hmm. unusual, you know, uh, yeah. suspects, you know, uh, advocate of the uh, solidarity dividend, you know, before the fact, right? So yeah. do you see this pro-immigrant stance in conservative thought today? And if not, do you have hope that it will gain credibility again in conservative circles? I mean, There are, there are a lot of homeless conservatives right now, right? So Pauline just showed 
highest ever level rate of people saying they're independents, right? 49% independents. Um, I think there are a lot of Bush conservatives that feel that way about immigration. And I think that that general proposition is actually a majority opinion in the country. Um, we are not a you know, border wall supporting country. Um, but I do think that right now, sadly, if you look at kind of the new idea, the, the sort of insurgent new ideology within right, ele right, right elected officials, it's actually like softer on um, industrial policy and public spending and harsher on the social stuff, right? It's the J.D. Vance and the Josh Howley, you know, I'm super smart. I'm part of this sort of, you know, ascendant intellectual wing of the movement. And what I have to say is that we need to get back to a place where, you know, every hardworking man has a wife at home and a traditional family and a great job and not a lot of global competition or competition from immigrant workers. And, you know, there's no birth control and no um, abortion, right? Um, so I, I don't, I, because of that, I'm not that optimistic about where the sort of younger people in the party are going on immigration. But again, I think that's way out of step with the country. Thank you. So uh, this is uh, gonna be our last question. It's a lovely one uh, to end on uh, because it asks for kind of marching orders or a call to action for all of us from you. Uh, so what can diversity, equity, and inclusion leaders do within the organizations that could have the biggest ripple effect in society? So tell us what to do. Oh. <laughs> That's a big one. Um, well, as I'm closing, I just wanna say thank you, Kenji, for this conversation. It's been so lovely to be able to talk with you. Um, thanks to everyone for tuning in on your Wednesday afternoon. You could have been doing a lot of different things. Um, I, um, you know, I'm always a little low to say, what's the one thing that you could do to, to you know, what's the silver bullet? Um, but I do think that, From my experience, much smaller potentially than the questioner in terms of, you know, I was running a nonprofit, you know, $13 million organization, 75 staff. Um, but we did a, a pretty dramatic racial equity transformation in the organization um, from being the, I was the only person of color on the executive team and it was 75% white when I became the president. Um, we doubled the organization's size and have, it was, you know, when I left and still today as a majority person of color organization. Um, I did learn that one thing that's really important for change management, which is what we're really talking about here, is really celebrating your wins and um, communicating 10 times more than you think you need to about why you're doing it and lifting up the small signs of incremental progress to help people feel like there's actual momentum and that all of this is, is working and is worthwhile. Because we usually use words like historical and legacy and intractable and all that to deal, to describe these problems of racism, it can feel like, well, nothing we can do can really nudge it right but you know the civil rights marchers didn't sing we won't overcome <laughs> you know, they said we shall overcome right and there's a reason for that um you know racism is a lie like the idea that there's a hierarchy of human value and some groups of people are better than others is a lie and it's not a very good one and it is possible to jettison it and it is possible to face the ways in which our practices and policies and structures within institutions and in society have been guided by that lie and to unpack them and to create new systems. It's totally possible. We've done much more complicated things. Um, and so I just think it's really important to, I mean, you know, 
I'm not a DEI consultant and some folks can you know, look and say, this is what you need to do for your institution. But whatever you're doing, if you're trying to transform, um, remember that people are motivated by a sense of, I can do this, we can do this, this is not beyond us, and a sense of celebrating the progress as it comes. I love that. And uh, as you were talking, I was mulling over the fact that it's not just we shall overcome, it's we shall overcome dot, 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 someday, right? So there's no, yeah. kind of, you know, date certain by which all of this is going to be accomplished. We, none of us know uh, when we'll be done, right? But so right. I think that makes it all the more important to celebrate the wins along the way. That's right. This is a win for me, Heather. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We celebrate you. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for uh, the wonderful book and all your wisdom. And we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other.